Back now at CBS News World Headquarters here in New York with CBS's continuing coverage of the attack on America. The headlines of this hour, 8 o'clock in the East. Security is notched up at the White House as President Bush takes a higher profile to reassure the nation. For security's sake, Vice President Cheney moves from the White House to a separate location, Camp David, Maryland. The Justice Department now says it has photographs of what it believes to be all of the hijackers who are in planes. We hope to show you those as the evening goes along. The flight data recorder has been found from the plane that crashed 80 miles from Pittsburgh, and transponder signals have been detected deep inside the rubble of the Pentagon from the black boxes of the plane that crashed there. The recorders from the hijacked planes could shed light on the terrorists and how they carried out their attacks. U.S. Secretary of State Powell says Osama bin Laden is, quote, a prime suspect. The number of missing or dead in all of the attacks could top 5,000, most under the rubble of New York's Trade Center towers, where searchlights glow under darkening skies and fading hopes. In other major developments, Attorney General Ashcroft says there were 18 hijackers aboard the aircraft commandeered on the day of terror. The search is on for accomplices. President Bush declared tomorrow a day of prayer and remembrance for the victims. He will visit New York tomorrow, where the search goes on tonight for victims in the rubble of the World Trade Center. The government has lifted the ban on commercial flights, but the skies are still off limits to foreign airlines. There will be tighter security at all airports. The stock markets closed since the attack will reopen on Monday, not tomorrow. And Major League Baseball and NFL football will be canceled through the weekend. President Bush raised his public profile today to try to reassure the American people that the nation is secure and that the nation will respond. CBS's John Roberts reports the president did so as security was increased at the White House itself. John? Dan, since Tuesday night, the vice president has been staying overnight at Camp David, but coming into the White House during the day to work. Shortly after noon today, the administration decided it would be a better idea if the president and the vice president were not in the same location. So they moved Dick Cheney up to Camp David, where he will remain until this weekend. They say it is purely a precautionary measure. But it certainly seems to highlight the increased tensions in the nation's capital as President Bush prepared for what administration officials said today would be a campaign that could be measured in terms of years. The nation must understand this is now the focus of my administration. But now that war has been declared on us, we will lead the world to victory. From the Oval victory. Office today, echoed in the scarred canyons of New York, the drumbeat of war spread across the nation and around the globe. In Congress, President Bush sought authority to commit the American military into harm's way. And he is working the phones, as his father did 11 years ago in the Gulf War, to build a global coalition against the terrorists who shattered buildings and stole lives. We have just seen the first war of the 21st century, and there is universal approval of, um, of uh, the statements I have made, and I am confident there will be universal approval of the actions this government takes. Around the president, there is now a heightened state of alert. The motorcade route to a Washington hospital today, lined by police with automatic weapons. The security cordon around the White House again pushed back. Pennsylvania Avenue now off limits to anyone without a government pass. Mr. Bush would not talk today about what administration officials say is growing evidence that alleged Saudi terrorist leader Osama bin Laden is to blame for Tuesday's attacks. But the White House did give more information about the threat against the president's life aboard Air Force One, saying the Secret Service received a telephone call in which Air Force One was specifically targeted. Even the aircraft's military codename was used. That explanation helped to dampen criticism that the president was seen as hiding by rushing to a bunker in Nebraska rather than return immediately to Washington. The elder President Bush, once the target of an assassination attempt in Kuwait, today admonished his son's critics. Uh, I've got to confess to being a little annoyed at the attacks on him for following security procedures, uh, not rushing right back to Washington. But as you've seen in today's paper, there was some credible uh, uh, threats on the life of the president, indeed on the White House itself. The president has made every effort to be visible in the past two days, visiting victims of the Pentagon bombing in the hospital today after seeing the devastation for himself last night. And even as he sought to place America on a war footing, 
Mr. Bush became visibly upset about the monumental challenge confronting his young presidency and the nation. This is a terrible moment. But this country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy that came upon America. The White House sending the message today that this is going to be a long struggle. This is not something that is going to be over in a matter of days. And they said that they are resisting the notion of some sort of quick response while losing sight of the long struggle. They want this, they said, Dan, to be a sustainable war. Reporting live from the White House, John Roberts. As often happens at a time of national emergency, the American public is rallying around the president. A CBS News poll out tonight finds 76% of Americans questioned approve of the way Mr. Bush is handling the crisis. His overall job approval rating has jumped 22 points, up to 72%. At the U.S. Defense Department, the Pentagon, one target of the attack on America, serious planning is underway to strike back. And as CBS's David Martin reports, they have a very good idea who they want to hit and how they want to do it. David? Dan, a U.S. official now calls the evidence against Osama bin Laden compelling. And Secretary of State Powell left absolutely no doubt about what the U.S. plans to do. And uh, at that point, we will go after that group, that network, and those who have harbored, supported, and aided that network to rip the network up. U.S. officials say they are drafting plans to attack not just bin Laden, but the Taliban rulers of Afghanistan who allow him to operate from their territory, either killing bin Laden and destroying his camps or forcing the Taliban to turn him over. And, said Powell, that's not all. When we're through with that network, we will continue with a global assault against terrorism in general. A senior official named the Iranian-backed group Hezbollah, which in 1983 killed more than 200 American Marines in Beirut, and Hamas, which sends suicide bombers against Israeli civilians as two of the terrorist groups the U.S. intends to go after. And the Deputy Secretary of Defense explained what that would involve. You don't do it with just a single military strike, no matter how dramatic. It will be a campaign, not a single action. In the past, the U.S. has launched cruise missiles against bin Laden's training camps and arrested his accomplices in the bombing of American embassies. But Wolfowitz said that's not enough. It's not just simply a matter of capturing people and holding them accountable, but removing the sanctuaries, removing the support systems, ending states who sponsor ter terrorism. Ending states who sponsor terrorism means taking on not just Afghanistan, but countries like Iran and Iraq. And the cost will be astronomical. Wolfowitz said a $20 billion emergency spending bill now before Congress is just the down payment. Obviously, a significant piece of this is going to be to bring our armed forces to the highest level of preparedness to be able to execute whatever it is the president may ask them to do. Bodies pulled from the Pentagon arrived at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware for identification as the Defense Department estimated the total number of dead at 190. 126 people in the building and 64 more aboard the plane. Fear of a further collapse is making the task of recovering the bodies agonizingly slow. We would all like it to go uh, very quickly, but in doing things quickly, you have a very unstable building, and it's almost uh, at, a, at a crawling pace. It also slows the hunt for the plane's cockpit voice recorder, which could answer so many questions about the final moments. They thought they knew where it was, uh, that it is, we are close to it, but close doesn't mean a short period of time. There is no real hope of survivors, but one find did raise spirits. The Marine Corps colors still standing amid the wreckage. Everyone was pretty, uh, for the past two days, surprised that, you know, we had a set of Marine Corps colors intact, and so that was pretty symbolic of you know, why we're all here. Call that a moral victory, but a real victory is not going to come as easily as it did in America's wars against Iraq and uh, Serbia. This one is going to be nasty, costly, and long. Dan? Reporting live from the Pentagon, David Martin. As for the suspects in the attack, CBS's Jim Stewart reports investigators now know who the hijackers were, at least the one in the planes, and they have the pictures to prove it. Jim? 
Dan, first an update about the closure of the New York area airports. Police have arrested as many as five people there, including a man with a fake pilot's ID. It is unclear at this time if the arrest in, were involved the accomplices to Tuesday's attack. They did, however, result in the immediate closure once again of air traffic into New York. Meanwhile, the easiest part of this investigation may be over. Authorities are poised to release the names and photographs of the estimated 18 hijackers, but these suspects quite obviously are dead and no longer a threat. If there's a gnawing concern among federal investigators here tonight, it is this. Have we accounted for all the terrorist pilots? The terrorist who seized controls of the planes all attended aviation school in the United States, some as recently as a year ago. And FBI agents were busy today searching the former apartment of two of the suspects, including this man, Muhammad Atta, who was believed to be at the controls during the World Trade Center attacks. Using airport surveillance video, credit card receipts, and the passenger list, the FBI believes it has identified all the hijackers on the four flights. Unless contradicted by uh, evidence which uh, we wouldn't anticipate, uh, two planes had five hijackers and two other planes had four hijackers each. What is not as clear, however, is whether the dead hijackers left behind some live colleagues who may have attended the same aviation classes. Sources say the flight school records are being closely examined. Uh, we are continuing to develop um, an understanding of all the associates that these individuals had. In other development, sources say there is no evidence thus far that any other nation was involved in the attack. Some of the hijackers had lived in the U.S. for more than a year, say sources, and others were associated with the Islamic fundamentalist group believed to be responsible for attacking the USS Cole. Meanwhile, the collection of physical evidence continued with agents recovering what reads like a suicide note from the rental car of one suspect. While in Hamburg, Germany, police raided an apartment there based on an FBI request. There were also some dramatic arrests like these at Newark International Airport where four people were taken off a Saudi Arabian airliner, but it remains unclear whether they were associated with Tuesday's attacks. What is also not clear is just how much help the actual hijackers had, although agents assume it was a sizable network both here and abroad. The number of associates is, uh, is uh, significant, but uh, I don't think I, I, it'd be appropriate for me to try and attach a specific number. But again, Dan, what's got them all antsy is, is not a network of associates who may have provided food and lodging and funds to the hijackers, but comrades of theirs who were just as well trained as the dead hijackers were and may have their same intentions. Are they still here? Frankly, it appears that investigators just aren't sure. Dan. Jim Stewart, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft said, he said on our program earlier that uh, he was going to make the photographs of these hijackers in the sky available. Where are those photographs? Dan, I, I believe it's a logistics problem. I may be wrong, but they were promised initially at 4 p.m. Eastern time and then 7 p.m., and now we're told it's possible we won't see them at all tonight, but they assure everyone that uh, they do have the photographs. Dan. Jim Stewart, thanks. And, of course, if and when those photographs become available, you will see them here on this CBS station. Now let's turn to that police raid Jim mentioned in Hamburg, Germany. It was an apartment thought to have been rented last year by two of the hijackers, who died in Tuesday's suicide plane bomb attacks. Several people were detained, including an unidentified woman with a child. And Italian police are re-examining a hotel burglary last spring in Rome when thieves took the uniforms and passports of two American Airlines pilots. Two American jets were among the four hijacked Tuesday. As we've been reporting, the flight data recorder has been recovered from the plane that crashed Tuesday in southwestern Pennsylvania, about 80 miles from Pittsburgh. Bob Orr in Washington has the latest on this discovery and what it might tell us about that aircraft's last frantic moments. Bob? Well, Dan, the flight data recorder no doubt is key. It will provide investigators with important information on how the United 757 was being flown in the last moments. But investigators also really need the cockpit voice recorder, the second black box, to actually understand what happened on board the doomed jetliner. That investigators hope will have recorded the conversations as the hijackers tried to steer the plane to Washington and as it turns out towards a very high profile target. Tuesday's attack ended in rural Pennsylvania when the last of the four hijacked jetliners, United Airlines Flight 93, nosedived into the ground. 
But sources say as the wave of terrorism unfolded, it was that plane the Secret Service feared most after a telephone threat made it clear the target was Air Force One. When United Flight 93 took off from Newark at 8.43, Air Force One was parked in Sarasota waiting to take the president home from an education event. No one believes the hijackers ever intended to attack the president's plane in midair. But in just over an hour, both jets would be heading towards Andrews Air Force Base. At 9.35, United 93 veered from its planned flight route and headed back towards Washington. With the World Trade Center towers already on fire, the jet's erratic movements were enough to convince controllers that this plane, too, had been hijacked. Just three minutes later, at 9.38, American Airlines Flight 77 plowed into the Pentagon, the first hit in what authorities now believe was to be a double-barreled attack on Washington. Within minutes, at around 9.45, orders were given to evacuate the White House. On board Flight 93, a number of passengers learning of the New York attacks and cell phone calls with families decided to take back the plane. On the last phone call, he said that a group of them were getting ready to do something. And then he hung up and he never called back. In Florida, the president was told of the terrorism and cut short his visit. At 9.54, Air Force One took off for Washington. Flight 93, meanwhile, continued flying east into western Pennsylvania. And at 10.03, someone in the cockpit deliberately turned off critical radar information, leaving controllers in the dark about the movements of a jet that was now a flying bomb on a course for the nation's capital. Along Florida's Atlantic coast, Air Force One continued to fly north. But suddenly, at 10.14, the president's plane turned to the west. About six minutes later, the fight for control on board Flight 93 ended as the 757 with 45 people on board crashed in an unpopulated field. Air Force One, now out of danger, continued on, landing at Louisiana's Barksdale Air Force Base at 11.45. Today, the president defended the decision to divert Air Force One. I know I took the appropriate actions as the commander-in-chief to be in a position to be able to uh, make the decisions necessary for our government to handle the crisis. There is also new information about the other hijacked jetliner that did hit the Pentagon. Republican John Micah, the chairman of the House Aviation Subcommittee, says he's been told that plane may have actually flown over the White House and around the Capitol building before hitting the military headquarters. Micah called it, quote, sheer in-your-face terrorism. Dan? Bob Orr, we'll take you back to the Pentagon now. Is the U.S. military considering calling up reserves and National Guard units? David Martin has some news about that. David? Dan, if uh, we needed any more evidence about what this new uh, 21st century war against uh, terror terrorism is going to entail, uh, the Department of Defense is asking the president for authority to call up reserves. Uh, Pentagon officials say they need to call up about 30 to 50,000 reservists uh, to deal with the uh, destruction from these terrorist attacks and also to uh, man air defense posts uh, guarding against uh, future attacks. And you can be sure that if the U.S. gears up for going on the offensive against uh, Osama bin Laden and other terrorists, there will be further reserve call-ups as well. Dan? David Martin with breaking news at the Pentagon. Reserve units are going to be called up when no one knows and which ones no one is saying at the moment, but 40 to 50,000 additional reservists uh, may be called up to help with cleanup and to help with whatever is being planned in the way of retaliation against terrorists. Now, the federal government this morning lifted officially its unprecedented two-day ban on commercial passenger flights. Sandra Hughes in Los Angeles is watching America's slow return to the air. Sandra? Dan, it's starting to sound a lot more like an airport around here after two eerily silent days. The airports were given the all clear by the FAA this morning to start flying again. The American air transportation system took off today, a slow process that will demand even more patience from passengers. I mean, how can you be frustrated? People are suffering, so just deal with it. A visible reminder from the window of the first plane to land at Newark Airport. After this disaster, air travel will never be the same. We have taken every precaution to make sure that uh, it is safe to fly in America. 
Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta says that federal law enforcement agents will be posted at all airports and will recommend that military special forces should also be used. It wouldn't take that much more training to put the Delta forces on the airplanes. For now, no cargo or mail will be permitted on passenger jets. Also, for the time being, the nation's airspace is open to commercial traffic only. No private planes, no charters. One small plane landed without permission today in Mobile, Alabama. The airport was evacuated as a precaution. There was also an evacuation at Orlando's International Airport when a mysterious package was found, a sign that nerves are still raw. Security was so tight in Seattle, each individual car entering the airport was stopped and searched. Still, passengers are eager to get moving again. And everyone is cooperate, cooperating, and even if it takes a couple more hours, so what? The first plane to land at Los Angeles Airport was a flight from Italy with at least one Hollywood actress on board that had spent the last two days in Canada. I'm telling you, I don't see that people are really going to want to fly. But what also greeted arriving passengers, stringent new security procedures. In L.A., no private vehicles will be allowed on the airport property. Arriving and departing passengers must use taxis and buses. The first people to arrive today were bused to a remote parking lot to meet their rides. Los Angeles airport officials think that they and the rest of the nation will be back to about 50 percent capacity by the weekend. Full flying capacity possibly by the end of next week. I wouldn't hesitate in a minute to fly or put my family on any aircraft or any airline operating out of this airport today. I think the system is completely safe. Safer say some because the government is mandating stricter security measures. No curbside check-in, only ticketed passengers will be allowed into the boarding area. And no knives of any kind allowed on board a flight. But is it enough? Well, most travelers we talk to say yes, anything more would make air travel almost impossible. Now, while the system continues to gear up, the FAA has temporarily prohibited the landing of international flights by foreign airlines. Dan. Sandra Hughes at Los Angeles International Airport. CBS's Lee Cowan is also at Ground Zero here in Lower Manhattan, and he tells us the many searchers are going about their work at great risk to themselves. Lee? Dan, uh, the, uh, there's renewed fear tonight of even more building collapses. Uh, this has been a concern all along, obviously, since Tuesday, but tonight some specific concerns that engineers have. One was the American Express building, and then another was another 60-story uh, tower in the area as well. But we just talked to a rescuer who finished his 12-hour shift in the pit as they're now calling the scene. And he said he was in and around the American Express building for the better part of the day. And to his eye, uh, an untrained eye, he admits, but to his eye, it appeared to be just fine. Nevertheless, though, the threat of just falling debris and indeed another complete collapse isn't far from any of the rescuers' minds. At least half a dozen buildings around the side are as shaky as the nerves of the rescuers working near them, and with good reason. This is the lobby of what used to be one of New York's finer hotels. In an instant, the ground floor became ground zero as the South Tower collapsed right across the street. From behind the reservation desk, computers still glow. Around the corner, elevators sound a faint alarm, just like the one at the security desk. It's urgency, a flashing understatement. There are a host of eerie scenes in the wake of this disaster, but perhaps no place really describes how sudden it all happened than here. This is the restaurant in the Hilton Millennium Hotel at the World Trade Center. At the time of the blast, it was breakfast time. Coffee cups still filled with coffee, breakfast plates now covered in dust. Still hanging on the walls, a reminder of what used to be, while out the next window, the reality of what is now. After three buildings collapsed during the first day, today, new signs that other buildings are beginning to fail as well. I just worked the night shift overnight, and they pulled us out because the fire department said it was structurally unsafe. Throughout the day and night, volunteers like Don Boyd were evacuated from the site for fear searching through the rubble might bring down some more. And at every turn, the ghosts of those who were here still remain. They were going about their business, and, and the next thing you know, their lives changed forever. This home video taken by Boyd shows what was left behind by those who fled this nearby atrium. Scattered on the floor, the remnants of a morning that started like any other. 
different. There were menus blown out into the area. There was people's identification. There were books, there were pictures. I mean, these are lives. I mean, they represent lives all over. Just to the left of that gaping hole in the building's side is one of many makeshift morgues. I mean, a, a police officer that I was talking to, was he was bagging and tagging fingers and hands, just taking fingerprints. Is this one person? Is this two people? I mean, is this three people? And I mean, the guy's like, these are our own, man. I mean, you know, what are we going to do? In so many places tonight, it's up to the firefighters alone to comb through the wreckage, while the helping hands of volunteers remain idle, waiting for the all clear to return. You want to go back in? Yeah, I mean, I'm here. I, if they call me right now, I could do another shift, without a doubt. And call they did. Working on no sleep and a lot of faith, Boyd joined up with another group of strangers to head back into hell. Dan, rescuers tonight are attempting to get underneath that rubble, either by crawling into manhole covers if they can find them, or trying to crawl into subway tunnels. Tunnels some tonight fear may be tombs. Dan. Lee Callen, live in lower Manhattan. Well, in times of trouble, we hear CBS News often turn to our old friend, distinguished Professor Fuad Ajami of Johns Hopkins University. Professor, people talk about the response, uh, in the sense of, uh, of the Arab world. Is yes. there such a monolithic thing as the, quote, Arab world? Well, there really is, as you well know, there is no such thing as an Arab world. It may be a fantasy of someone like Osama bin Laden. He would like to create this Arabian world. He sees us as an obstacle to that world. But that world is very diverse, and the response to our calamity, the response to the World Trade Center and to this human tragedy has been varied and has been all over the place, surprising in many ways in the Arab world. Gaddafi, remember him? The man we described as a flake, the man we took on in 1986, he's condemned this deed uh, in, uh, against uh, our civilian. And well, against me, our... Who would want Gaddafi into a coalition? We wouldn't, exactly, exactly. But surprising people have in effect spoken because they fear that the world of Islam is being pulled in radical directions. People who offer fatwas, i.e. religious opinions, who would like to contest for the soul of Islam and who would like to introduce the idea of a moderate Islam. So there, is, there are all kinds of opinions and all kinds of judgments have been heard in the Muslim world in the last 48 hours or so. And some of them are quite encouraging. And I think when it comes to making our decision, it's good to know that the place will be receptive, but it really is our burden and our call. Senator Joe Biden, head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, in an interview with Bob Schieffer this afternoon, I thought spoke with a remarkable candor. Uh, he was talking about, in effect, pressuring Pakistan yes. to maybe close its border, allow overflights, those weren't mentioned specifically, but they're in the, in the pattern, pressuring Pakistan uh, to pressure the Taliban. And he said that they, they could pressure the Taliban. But then the question was asked, well, yes, but the Taliban can pressure him, right. maybe to the extent of toppling the Pakistan government. And Senator Biden said, I thought, uh, with great frankness, yeah, that's a risk, but it's a risk we're now willing to take. Put that into context for us. Well, that's a good question. And the question is, is General Musharraf himself willing to, to take a risk of being overthrown? Is he willing to be seen as being a friend of the United States? We have a problem there in Pakistan and beyond is that there are rulers, they wink at us, they tell us behind closed doors that they will be with us when it counts. But when the time comes, they fear the wrath of their own people and they retreat. General Musharraf, who came to power in Pakistan with a coup d'etat, he understands fully that the Taliban are in many ways an instrument and a creation of the Pakistani intelligence services. And here's Afghanistan, which you know, a landlocked country. It relies upon Pakistan for support of every kind. So we need the Pakistanis on board, or else we must tell, we must made, make the Pakistanis understand, and the Egyptians and others, that it's really a fight to the finish, and they either are our friends or they ride with the brigands. It was said today by a man who's written some 60 books on, on the general subject of terrorism that Osama bin Laden uh, has connected to people in 55 countries. Right. He basically said his cells in 55 countries. If bin Laden has cells in 55 countries, is it realistic to say we're going to wipe him out and wipe out terrorism? Well, that's the question. In effect, there is no such thing as there is no, there is no magic bullet. There is no deliverance from this war. There is, no, there is no safe exit for us from the struggle against terrorism. But likewise, we can't use the idea that bin Laden is a phenomenon, as one of our sources told us uh, a while ago, uh, as a cop-out. Because we have to understand that if indeed it's bin Laden, who has been tormenting us, bombing our embassies, and now coming to our country, then it's really time to finish with this particular account. 
Kuwara Jami. Thank you. And you are watching continuing CBS News coverage of the attack on America. At CBS News World Headquarters in New York, Dan Rather with continuing coverage of the attack on America and what will be tomorrow a national day of prayer and remembrance. Here are the headlines at this hour. Pentagon officials are asking the president for permission to call up between 30 and 50,000 reserve troops. A united Congress is preparing to vote $40 billion to fight terrorism. That's double of what was talked about just a day ago and to support recovery and rebuilding in New York and at the Pentagon. The confirmed death toll in Tuesday's attacks is near 500, but add those officially missing and the eventual death toll could top 5,000. The United States is asking Pakistan to close its borders with Afghanistan and permit U.S. military flights over its territory, possible preparation for a retaliatory strike at Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan if he can be found, and perhaps even if he can. And President Bush says the United States will, quote, lead the world to victory in a war against terrorism. He calls it the first world war of the 21st century. Now, some of the day's other important developments. President Bush will fly to New York City tomorrow to see the rescue effort for himself. He's declared tomorrow a national day of prayer and remembrance. Today, the president visited the Pentagon casualties in what he's calling the first war of the 21st century. Attorney General Ashcroft says investigators are now following thousands of leads. He says there were at least 18 hijackers in the sky. The Pentagon promised a sustained U.S. military campaign, but did not say what the target might be. The government today reopened the skies to commercial planes, strict new securities in effect, including no curbside check-in. The stock market was closed again today. Standard & Poor's predicts the terror fallout will include a recession. Now, let's pause, slow down perhaps a bit, and talk about this day's events with two of CBS News' most senior and seasoned reporters, our Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer, who's on Capitol Hill tonight, and our Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts, who is at the White House. Bob, you said several times today, mm -hmm. you just sort of said, in effect, Phew, what a day. Of all the events right. that happened on Capitol Hill, which one is likely to stand the test of being something important in history? Well, we had, a, we had a bomb threat here. We had the Capitol evacuated again for the second time uh, since all this has begun. But I think the thing, Dan, that, uh, that we're going to remember what is significant here is the Congress has continued this uh, bipartisan spirit. Congressional leaders this afternoon, uh, the president asked, had asked, as you well know, for $20 billion uh, in, in aid, special aid to... Uh, uh, special aid to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we have a lot of crosstalk here. No problem. I, I lost my train of thought. He'd asked for $20 billion uh, in aid uh, to track down the terrorists and also to help the victims of all this terrible tragedy in New York. Well, at the urging of the New York delegation, the congressional leaders have decided to double that appropriation to $40 billion, $20 billion to go to New York and $20 billion uh, to aid in this fight. Uh, to track down these people and punish them if necessary. And Tom Daschle, the leader of the Democrats, said, we understand that this is just a down payment. I think the thing is, Dan, they have realized here that we are indeed in some kind of a war, and it's not going to be a one-shot war. It's going to take a while. Well, if anybody had any doubts about that, Bob, the news that uh, David Martin broke a while back that the Pentagon is asking for authority to call up some 40 to 50,000 reservists should yeah. put... Uh, to underscore for everybody, it is war with all capital letters. Let's go over to John Roberts at the White House. John, uh, there was a period this afternoon when things moved rather rapidly and made it clear uh, that for whatever reason, that security was being ratcheted up quite a bit again. Uh, it certainly was, Dan. And, and if I could just pause for a moment, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But we, we've just learned 
that this request for a call-up of the reserves is under active consideration here at the White House tonight. However, this would be a limited call-up, and it would be for specific reasons. Now, the White House not elaborating on what those specific reasons are, but let's not forget, Dan, that there's a law here called Posse Comitatus in which uh, members of the military cannot be used in civilian law enforcement. So perhaps if they were to be called up for security, it may be added security around bases or government installations. Uh, as for the security around the White House, uh, certainly, Dan, there does seem to be a heightened sense of alert here. Uh, as happened on Tuesday, they have now moved back a security perimeter around the White House to an area that really encompasses about uh, eight or ten city blocks. Exactly the same thing that we saw on Tuesday. Uh, we, we understand that uh, they've moved it out for now. They may move it back, and then they may move it back out again. It all depends on the type of information and intelligence that's coming in from across the globe. Also, something else significant happened today. The vice president has been spending nights at Camp David uh, up in the Catoctin Mountains and spending days here at the White House, Dan. Today, they separated the vice president and the president. Mr. Cheney will stay at Camp David until this weekend. John Roberts at the White House. Night has fallen for the third time over Ground Zero, the scene of the attack that crumbled the World Trade Center towers. And CBS's Byron Pitts is there tonight. Byron? Well, Dan, these are the cold heart numbers tonight. 4,763 people missing. 30,000 body bags made available. More than 600 tons of rubble removed so far. Five square miles of Manhattan shut off. But today, in the midst of those cold numbers, there have been some warm moments. I witnessed one of those moments today as firefighters rescued one of their own, a man who had been buried beneath the rubble for several hours. This is Ground Zero. What you're watching is a videotape shot by a fireman. TV cameras were not allowed this close to the scene, but I managed to make my way in. You can begin to hear, Dan, hopefully those are far. At that moment, I was reporting by cell phone the successful rescue of one firefighter. Pulled to safety, then walked through a gauntlet of applause as grown men cried. They're shaking his hand. I believe the man himself is crying. Right now, they're trying to get a medic to him. He says he's okay. He's telling everyone he's okay. It was one of those moments these rescue workers live for. For nearly 48 hours, men and women, cops, construction workers, and firefighters have scratched and pulled and cut their way through a mountain of rubble that was once the World Trade Center. 1,600 volunteers called in. Thousands more just showed up. Hey, we need buckets and a couple of guys. Buckets. Bucket. In the midst of it all, reminders of reality. Inside that orange body bag, one of too many victims. Today, for the first time, rescue teams reached the bottom of Tower One. These are the first images out, taken by a rescue worker, of the dark and deadly corners that must be searched. Surreal, quiet images, stillness that often ends suddenly. Excuse me, sir, have you heard what happened? Twice today, rescue workers were ordered to run when it was feared another building was about to collapse. Besides the two World Trade Center towers, at least four other buildings have fallen, and portions of at least eight others may go next. We have 4,763 people on the missing persons list. Today, the mayor of New York City and the governor of New York State took a call from the president. We will be with you when the United States takes firm and appropriate action to those who conducted this evil. Aid by the truckload is still pouring into New York City, but anguish is never far behind. That fire department chaplain who died Tuesday was killed as he gave last rites to a firefighter laying at his feet. Yeah, this is what Michael Judge was all about. He said, Lord, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Tell me what you want me to say and keep me out of your way. Tonight I've been told one of those firefighters who was rescued today, who had spent several hours under the rubble, uh, when they brought him out, they washed his face off, they gave him an IV, the firefighter asked for a peanut butter sandwich, he ate it, he put back on his helmet and went back to work. Dan, that is the kind of will, the kind of strength we've seen from these men and women here. Byron Pitts, live from Lower Manhattan. Thanks.
The strike at the World Trade Center was meant to be a strike against America. It was also a strike against a neighborhood. And as Mika Brzezinski reports, the emergency service workers are determined to strike back with a massive show of support and help. New York is a tale of two cities, one bustling as usual, the other at its breaking point. But the city hasn't lost its humanity. Medic Peter Marrero has been at ground zero twice and desperately wants to get back in. You're not in New York, you're not in America, you're not even on Earth anymore. And what drives you to go back in there? People need help. Help is what this city needs, and not just in the disaster zone. The collapse destroyed two electrical substations, leaving 12,000 in lower Manhattan without power. And then there's the endless work of hauling all this away. The Trade Center used to tower over this neighborhood. Now, what's left of it is being driven to a local dump. And in every piece of debris, there's a story. We've got receipts here. The address is the World Trade Center. This is Kidder Peabody. This is a CEO's card, one World Trade Center. You really get a sense that these were all these people's lives and all that's left is this paperwork. Disbelief is still on the faces of people here, but the emotions of those who've been at the scene are turning into something much more. A visceral gut reaction to what they've seen at Ground Zero. Down there is not pleasant, I'll tell you that, right? When Larry Galvin retired from the fire department a year ago, he thought he'd seen it all. He volunteered for duty again right after the blast, and now he's lost many of the brothers. He came back to help. You could just see all them guys going in trying to save people, and they wind up getting smothered under it. That's a part that hurts. That sacrifice is appreciated by these residents. All are inconvenienced. Most just want to go home. Ron and Sharon Buttrin live just blocks from the scene, and they are staying right where they are. But we're not going to leave here because th this is going to last a very long time, and at some point we will be able to do something to help. Right now we feel very helpless. We want to go down there and start digging with our own hands. The nobility of those people is overwhelming. And the heartbreak of the families, and I just don't want to be any place else right now. The rescuers certainly are noble, but they're also human. And amidst all the devastation and need behind me, the Red Cross has put out a call for psychological support. They say they need licensed psychologists and licensed psychiatric nurses because the terror here is tearing many apart. Dan. Mika Brzezinski, live from Lower Manhattan. The shocking East Coast attacks on Tuesday have had repercussions all across the nation, altering many comfortable routines and changing lives forever. CBS's Bill Whitaker in Los Angeles has more about this. Bill? Well, Dan, this monstrous national horror is made up of many, many individual stories. Americans out west were spared the blast, but not the aftershocks. As the nation watched in disbelief, pilot Jim Bagley of 29 Palms, California, had added reason to be stunned. The FBI suspects the Florida flight school where Bagley trained may have been the training ground for terrorists, too. There's no doubt in my mind that the air crews were replaced by terrorists who were trained to make this suicide mission. The FBI has tied the terrorists to several Florida flight schools, including Flight Safety International, where Bagley was certified. Reportedly, some of the suspected terrorists were learning to fly commercial jets there at the same time Bagley was. But certainly somebody coming out with the commercial level of experience from one of these training programs could very easily navigate that jet after commandeering it and take it back and put it into the World Trade Center. And when the plane slammed into the World Trade Center, San Francisco businesswoman Melissa Hughes was meeting on the 104th floor of the North Tower. She called her husband of one year, Sean, and left this message. Sean, it's me. I just wanted to let you know I love you, and I'm stuck in this building in New York. A plane hit the building where a bomb went off. We don't know, but there's lots of smoke, and he just wanted you to know that I love you always. He's called 40 New York hospitals and victim hotlines, but has heard nothing of her since Tuesday morning. I just wanted to wake up and just... just somehow just have it not happen, have it be a bad dream. But this nightmare was real. Let's not blame the innocent. So again today, Americans of all ages, races, and religions came together, like at this church in Los Angeles, to stand by our values. 
and stand Los by Angeles each other. Like at this UCLA memorial service. But the shock waves are still rippling out. Deep to right field. Out of respect and solidarity, Major League Baseball has postponed all games through Sunday. So has the NFL, college football, and NASCAR. Even Hollywood is turning down the volume. The new Schwarzenegger movie about Colombian terrorists has been shelved for now. We do not tolerate attacks on our citizens. The reaction to the attack has had some unintended consequences, too. The big Montana wildfires grew even bigger while all planes, even firefighting tankers, were grounded. The tankers now are back in the air. Now another unintended consequence. A plane delivering a heart for transplant from Anchorage to Seattle yesterday was forced to land by Navy fighters. After some tense negotiations, arrangements were made for the heart to be transferred by helicopter. The surgery was a success. Dan? Bill Whitaker, give us a quick uh, overview of what's happening with air traffic on the West Coast, San Diego, as well as Los Angeles, San Jose, Portland, Seattle. What's happening? Well, very, very slowly, things are starting to open back up. There are commercial flights that are going to be coming into Los Angeles. We understand that up in Seattle, things are beginning to get back to normal very, very slowly. But I, when I say back to normal, it will probably never be back to normal. We are going to have long, long waiting periods before anyone can get into the airport and before things can get into the air once again. Dan? Bill Whitaker, thanks. The attack on America is more than just an attack on our buildings and monuments. It is, above all, an attack on Americans. The numbers that describe the big picture of this tragedy are too great to fully comprehend. Almost 5,000 missing or dead at the World Trade Center, more than 100 missing or dead at the Pentagon, 266 killed aboard the four hijacked jetliners. But it's hard to quantify heartache until you come face to face with it. Thomas Burnett, Jr. was a 38-year-old business executive from San Ramon, California. He was killed when the plane he was on slammed into the Pentagon. He leaves behind a wife, a three-year-old toddler, and five-year-old twins. Stephen Strobert is missing. Stephen, who is 33 and has been married less than a year, worked 100 floors above Manhattan in the World Trade Center. More than 700 of his fellow employees from the trading firm of Cantor Fitzgerald are still unaccounted for. This is Cece Ross Lyles, sitting between her sons, Jerome and Javon. Cece was a flight attendant aboard United Airlines Flight 93. She spoke to her husband for the last time from a cell phone shortly before the hijacked plane went down outside Pittsburgh. Robert LeBlanc was a retired geography professor from Lee, New Hampshire. He died aboard United Flight 175 when it struck the World Trade Center. He was 70 years old. And then there is William Fian, a father of four and grandfather of six. Fian was the second highest official of the New York City Fire Department. He died Tuesday when the World Trade Center's South Tower collapsed on his command station. Fian's father was a fireman. So is his son. William Fian, 71, one of the bravest. Five personal stories out of 5,000. The cost of this tragedy in dollars and cents may eventually be calculated and perhaps even made good someday. The human cost, though, is something else again. Maybe you noticed it. Parents and their children walking to school, especially in New York and Washington, walked a little closer together. Hands held a little tighter. And the question was, what to tell the children about the attack on America? CBS's Cheryl Atkinson in Washington has our report. For those who were hit so close to home, it was the first day back at school in a changed world. I think it was really sad. I thought it was really sad because a lot of people died. 200 counselors were deployed to schools in the District of Columbia on a mission to fight fear and grief. Her fear right now is that it's going to happen again. Experts advise parents to tell their children it's okay to feel scared. It's just so scary. I mean, nothing ever happened. Or nothing ever happened like that in my life. It's all right to be sad. It was horrible. It made me want to cry. Yeah. And it's normal to feel angry. Yes, I, I think we should kill them all. 
The question of what to tell children becomes even more difficult when the loss is more personal. Leckie Elementary in Washington, D.C. lost a teacher and an 11-year-old student in the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. 30 counselors are at this one school alone to help children cope. They wrote goodbye letters to the teacher, Hilda Taylor. Miss Taylor, I miss you a whole lot from Durham. And their classmate, Bernard Brown. And how do you keep them from feeling overly fearful or overly sad? By spending time with them, by, by encouraging them, uh, by touching them, by giving them hugs. Children everywhere are in need of those hugs, touched by the frightening images of kids their own age running in terror. I really can't understand why people did this. If I had been on the airplane, I would be really scared. My sister told me that on TV, she saw like a person with a white shirt jump, jump out of the building. In fact, if there was one horrible image that seemed to haunt children the most, it was the sight of people jumping from the burning World Trade Center. A lot of people just jumped off the building and it was really sad looking at that. Back in Washington, D.C., proximity poses an added challenge. It was close to us, that's one thing. Because it could have gone in school, so we would be dead right now. It's important that by living here, fear not grip them. You know, saying, you know, oh my God, I live in Washington, but instead, oh my God, I'm a very special American because I live in the nation's capital. Right now, most of these kids would rather not be so special. I wish everything was normal. Cheryl Atkinson, CBS News, Washington. And joining us now from Washington in our bureau there, the former Defense Secretary of the United States and former United States Senator from Maine, now a CBS News consultant, Bill Cohen. Mr. Secretary, you've watched and listened today. History's going to look back and say, among other things, this is the day when the Defense Department asked for a a call-up of maybe 40 to 50,000 reserves. Put that in context for us. Well, it's just uh, one more signal coming from the administration that uh, they are serious. And uh, a call-up of uh, 40 to 50,000 uh, uh, men and women in the reserves is just a, a very strong signal that that's uh, the beginning. And frankly, I think if it uh, comes to it, there may be more uh, who will be called up. Uh, they will be used in a variety of ways, and it uh, remains for the president to specify their uh, utility. But they will be uh, helping at, um, uh, at our uh, facilities, our airport uh, facilities, the military airport facilities. They may be uh, driving heavy construction equipment. They may be uh, called upon to go overseas and to uh, uh, carry on whatever campaign the president decides to wage. But this is a very important step along with that that took place on Capitol Hill. Bob Schieffer pointed out earlier. Uh, that uh, something unusual took place today. In years past, whenever an administration would make a request uh, for a certain amount of money, usually Congress would end up cutting it in half. Now they've doubled it. And I suspect that when uh, all is uh, done, they may even have to increase it uh, substantially more for the military itself. So this was quite a historic day, and it once again sends a very strong signal to the American people, to our friends and allies, and to our adversaries that uh, we mean business. Mr. Secretary, I asked this of Fuad Jami earlier. I was told today by someone in a position to know that Osama bin Laden has, he's in 55 countries in one way or in the other, greater influence than some, but in 55 countries, is it realistic to believe that we can wipe him, his operation, his movement out completely? Uh, I think that, uh, yes, it's realistic. Uh, if we uh, go after uh, him and his operations uh, and his uh, financial network, uh, it can be done. It's going to take time, and that's why the administration is being very uh, cautious and prudent in its uh, rhetoric by saying, uh, prepare for the long haul. Uh, but this is going to be a battle that's going to take uh, years, uh, not days or months, but years, because they have uh, infiltrated our society and uh, so many others uh, across the globe. It's going to take a lot longer than anyone anticipates. And again, I think we have to be realistic in the sense of what uh, may be called upon for us to bear in the future. Uh, we can't uh, look upon the most recent attacks as being the end of it, but rather the beginning. And once again, the, uh, the hart Rudman Commission uh, foretold this particular type of uh, situation, and it's a clarion call for us to change uh, our habits, change our, uh, our way of thinking about the threats uh, that are going to confront us. But now is the time to seize upon this particular tragedy as an opportunity to fundamentally deal with a threat that is going to uh, continue to, uh, to confront us. You mentioned Osama bin Laden's financial network. What did you mean by that? 
Well, he uh, is well financed. He is uh, uh, reputed to have uh, millions of dollars uh, as a result of the inheritance through the construction family uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and he has used those millions to help fund these particular cells. And uh, so what we have to do is to make sure that we go after, in every way we can, those uh, resources that he uh, uses to provide for the training, assuming that he is the one involved, that can uh, pay the five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars in cash for the training of pilots who uh, pays for the uh, uh, the families uh, for those who martyr themselves and uh, pays them uh, some sort of remittance uh, going after the uh, the financial resources will be just uh, a key element of going after him uh, and his entire organization and once again i need to repeat this we shouldn't just focus on one individual and say he is the the cause of all of this and responsible for all of this there are a number of organizations they may be uh, overlapping and interlocked. And so it's going to be a long, hard struggle, and we have to prepare ourselves for it here and abroad. And that's why the administration, I think, is, is correct in preparing uh, the, uh, the American people for the long struggle. Including now saying it's going to call up some reserves. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. This week marked a tragic milestone in the United States of America history, one of many the nation have experienced. CBS's Eric Ingberg looks tonight at turning points on the U.S. timeline. History, for the most part, tick-tocks toward us in increments that produce trends, then maybe slight change. Only a few times in a generation will one day strike like a thunderclap, forever altering America's view of itself. It's the shock effect when it hits. Everybody stops still. Everybody gets calls to people they love. Everybody checks to make sure everybody's okay. October 29th, 1929 was such a day. The stock market crashed. A depression that would spread poverty and fear across the land was to follow. Most every ship in the harbor has been hit. December 7th, 1941, the day of the Pearl Harbor attack, brought both war and a feeling of vulnerability Americans had never known. On October 4th, 1957, Americans were jolted from space. It was called Sputnik, and it was the first man-made object to orbit the Earth, made in Russia. It frightened a country fearful of Soviet missiles and brought improvements in the U.S. education system. November 22nd, 1963 was the day America lost a young president to assassination. It was more harrowing than previous presidential deaths, because JFK was the first president of the television age. We were there, mourning someone we knew. Those images, they felt like a death, a death of a generation at that point. And from 63 onwards, the Kennedy death, some of the spirit of America was hurt. 1968, the assassination of Martin Luther King. It robbed the nation of its main voice for racial justice and severely damaged relations between blacks and whites as disturbances swept dozens of cities. On August 9, 1974, Richard Nixon was driven from office by a scandal which still reverberates. Americans who had instinctively trusted their officials to tell the truth simply stopped doing so. Veteran Washington correspondent Hugh Seide, who witnessed many of these days, believes last Tuesday to be one of the most critical ever. We've been uh, more interested in everything that we can do in our indulgences than the public good. And I think that has to change. September 11, 2001 joins the list of days that changed America because our homeland has been violated. When that happens, history teaches, Americans unify. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. The world acknowledges, usually, many people around the world, that in times of emergency, a crisis, Americans unify. But since World War II, there have been those doubts expressed by people in various countries around the world. But yes, you unify, but then it passes. And America has gotten a reputation over the last half century of not having a lot of staying power. The record doesn't support that. Vietnam, although it was a terrible time, comes to mind because among the many things we may not have had, staying power in that we did have. There was a remarkable scene today in London, a touching demonstration of the support between Britain and the United States at Buckingham Palace.
changing of the guard today at Buckingham Palace. You are watching continuing CBS News coverage of the attack on America.